Hi, it's Steve Hargada, and we're in the middle of reinventing the classroom. What a lot of fun. So delighted to have our midday keynote, the Stephen Anderson. Stephen, welcome. Thanks. I'm excited to, uh, to talk with everybody today. I'm excited to have you here. I, I don't know if you remember, but I give you credit for the idea of the School Leadership Summit. Do you remember that conversation? I, I do remember that conversation, and that's a that's a cool a, a cool uh, a conference that um, that's really kind of it's grown. It's it's really it's really cool to see it uh, in its present from its first year into kind of what it's turned into. Well, you can take credit for whatever it is, because I think that came out of the brainstorm you and I had. Thanks so much to Classflow for supporting this event, making it free. Go to classflow.com, or when you finish the session, you'll be taken to a survey, and there's a link to Classflow from there. Thanks also to Blackboard Collaborate for the platform. It's been super stable, and we so appreciate having it available to us. Those of you who are in the live audience, this is now your turn to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the star, look for the star to the left of the map, the second icon down, click on that, and then click on the map. And then you can put a note in the chat and let us know where you might be in the world. Looks like North America, Mexico, United States, Canada, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Yeah, North Carolina is well represented today. <laughs> <laughs> the hometown crowd. Must be. <laughs> Stephen, did you get any of those thunderstorms a couple of nights ago? No, I was, I was just talking to someone else about this this morning. And, uh, the news made a big deal about how we all needed to hunker down for several days. and um, It was cloudy, but it never did rain here at all. Well, you know, I'm not I'm not that far from you. We had massive thunderstorms. Keep you up at night, thunderstorms here in Asheville. Okay, keep those notes coming. And I'm gonna turn the time now over to Steve. Take it away. So thanks, Steve, and and thanks everybody for uh, for joining us, and and thanks to uh, to everybody for coming and spending. Um, what's uh, noon for me, so it's my lunch time, and uh, you know whatever time it is. I, it's just so cool to do these sessions that you get so many people from from across the globe. And you know, I saw Germany, I saw Australia, I saw all these different really cool places. And for me, it's it's as somebody who loves to be an educator and loves to show kids that the world is is really kind of this boundless place to have people who said, you know what, I'm going to get up at whatever hour it is, and I'm going to spend time. Uh, learning today about formative assessment. That's that's really, really cool to me. So um, so we're going to go through today, uh, just to give you an idea of who I am, um, that's me. I, I had was on video earlier today, but I'm not in one of my trademark bow ties. Um, I'm, I, I work from home, so I, um, I kind of take advantage, I take advantage of that, so I don't, I don't do a whole, a whole lot of video, uh, video chatting, but so I'm a I'm a a person who loves to work with teachers and loves to work with educators across the country and across the globe. I spend a lot of time talking and blogging and tweeting and uh, and, and doing those sorts of things. Uh, you can reach me at Web20 Classroom. That's my Twitter name, um, or that's my blog where you can get in touch with me there. I have lots of information about lots of different things in instructional technology and uh, and topics like that. So. What I want to do is I want us to focus on our conversation, and I don't want you to have to worry about getting, you know, wondering, oh, what was that? What was the name of that tool, or what was the website for that, or where did that image come from? So what I've done is that Bitly will take you to a Google Doc that has slide by slide all of the information that I'm going to talk about today, plus it has additional resources. So you know, image credits. Or when I get into some of the digital tools, I um, instead of you know having the the name on the slide, um, it it can be you know it can be kind of cumbersome because 
you know, you don't want to wait for everybody to write it down. So anyway, so there's a um, there's a, a doc that will live for in perpetuity for for you to have all of the resources and there might be some images that you want to take away that you want to be able to use. Um, everything's Creative Commons licensed, so uh, so you can use those. So I mean, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and my journey with formative assessment. Um, I was a classroom teacher. I taught middle school, which I don't know why anyone would teach any grades other than middle school. I think those are the best years. Um, I have lots of friends who are teachers, and um, you know they teach all kinds of different subject areas, and they say that they're oh, high schoolers are the best, or kindergarten is the best. I truly believe middle school is the best year, just because you see a tremendous amount of growth out of those out of those students. Um, my wife is a middle school teacher, and she's not she wasn't trained to be a middle school teacher. She's elementary certified, and she taught one year in in, uh, in middle school and hasn't gone back in ten years. So um, she's she's enjoyed it that much, but. My journey with formative assessment really started in my, my first, my first couple of years of teaching. So I was teaching science and, you know, upon reflecting about the kind of teacher I was, I was a terrible teacher. Um, and I, I, I am, I'm open and honest about the kind of teacher I was. Had I known today what I, I, had I known then what I know today, um, I would have been such a, a different, a better, a better kind of teacher. But I, you know, I learned just like every other uh, education major to um, to learn how to to be a teacher and 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 learn how to be a, 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 a you know to to get kids to you know classroom management. I learned all of those typical traditional things. And my my when I was student teaching, my um, the teacher who I was teaching with was a very old fashioned, very traditional teacher. And uh, so I I really didn't know anything other than. Um, than the traditional means, quote unquote traditional means. So I um, got into my classroom and I used those methods. I utilized those traditional methods. So I sat kids in rows. Um, I expected, you know, excellent behavior every moment. I only wanted kids to talk when, when I wanted them to talk. Um, I had them furiously copy down notes um, throughout the week and then we would go and we would do an assessment at the end of the week, kind of that unit test kind of deal, and it would be multiple choice, fill in the blank, true, false, and oh, if you didn't study for it or you failed, well, I'm sorry, you need to do better the next time. And it wasn't until I had a, a realization, I, I was coming home one day, and I was going through these papers, and I was thinking to myself, what am I doing? I'm having these kids, and they're they're not learning anything. They're, they're, I'm spending all this time, and all they're really doing is just copying what I'm telling them to, to do, and they're not, the information is not clicking with them. And then I'm not knowing that it's not clicking with them until I take the, until, until they take their assessment at the end of the week or at the end of the unit. And by then it's too late. We needed to move on, so I didn't have time for them to go back. And really, if they did go back, what benefit would that serve anyway? So there had to be a better way. So I started talking to some some teacher colleagues of mine, and everybody, that's how everybody was teaching. Everybody was, was kind of doing the same things and saying, well, these kids are in middle school. They need to learn because that's how they're going to be in high school. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to stop giving tests like that. One, I hated grading them. They were awful. They were terrible. I spent most of my time at nights and on weekends um, grading those tests, and I didn't. I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to focus more on being a, a better teacher or being better for my kids. And so I said, you know, I'm just going to start trying to figure out at the end of every day. I'm going to try to figure out what is, did they get what I was trying to teach them that day. So I didn't, at that point, I didn't change anything about my methods. I was still teaching them, you know, kind of the same, the same way I was. At the end of the day, they had sticky notes on their desk. I would ask them one or two questions. They would answer the questions. They would leave them on the, on their table. I would come around and pick them up and then I would go through them and I would say, okay, yep, there's a pretty good consensus. Everybody knows what they're talking on, what I'm talking about. Or no, they have no idea what I'm talking about. And so then I knew at the beginning of the next class, what I needed to do. And what I discovered on my own, which wasn't really revolutionary, people had been doing this for years, but it had never been taught to me, was that I was formatively assessing them. 
but that I was figuring out what they know, when they know it, in order to inform my teaching better. And from that moment on, when I discovered kind of haphazardly this idea of formative assessment, at the time I didn't, it didn't have a formal title to me, it was just felt like the right thing to do, my kids began to get to, to, to understand the material better. They began to feel more comfortable in class. They were much more engaged because we began experimenting with different ways to, to, to understand their knowledge or, uh, or to, to figure out what they knew when they knew it. And so, again, I, I just discovered this kind of this idea of formative assessment. It wasn't until after I left the classroom that I learned a lot more about formative assessment and how formative assessment can impact teaching that I really began to be to become a, 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 an advocate for formative assessment in the classroom. And, and to me, it's, it's, it's the way that we need to be teaching kids to, for, for we, it's the way that teachers need to be looking at their, their students in a way that helps them understand, okay, what do my kids know and when do they know it and how do I know that they know it? So today what I want to talk a little bit about is what are, what are the differences between summative and formative? And what are the differences between, uh, or what are some methods we can employ? So both digital and non-digital, what are some ways we can do that? So uh, James Popham, if you ever get the opportunity to read anything by James Popham, he is kind of like the godfather of assessment and especially formative assessment. But this, this quote where he talks about how we're caught up in, in teaching kids kind of how do we know, we're more worried about how to improve the, the test scores of students. That seems to be kind of the, the, the drumbeat and the, the, the shouting that's happening right now. How do we improve student test scores? How, do, how, are, how are students comparing to other students in other countries? It's forced aside when we, we, should be, when we should be looking at how do we teach the students the things that they need to know to be, access, uh, to, to be successful? How do we teach kids um, the types of things that, that make them critical thinkers and, and important collaborators. And, and all of that gets pushed aside for the summative. Uh, all of that gets, gets pushed aside for this high stakes testing, and it really shouldn't be. So if you ever get the opportunity to, um, to, to read anything by Popham about assessment, like if, they're, if, you're, if you're struggling with the ideas of assessment or, or want to just know more about where, where high stakes testing comes from or things like that, Popham is, is your go-to guy. So there, in our world and in the education world, there are really two types of assessments. So the summative assessment. The summative assessment is typically the assessment that's given at the end. It's the summary of learning. And we traditionally know them as the multiple choice high stakes test. Summative assessments have their place in learning. So you're not going to hear me say that summative assessments should disappear altogether. There is, so summative assessments do serve a purpose. When well-designed summative assessments can be used in order to inform decision-making, they can play an important, powerful tool in, in driving decisions in the classroom. However, the way that summative assessments have been used traditionally is this one-size-fits-all, let's give every kid the same test, let's give every kid the same, uh, the same question, no matter who they are, no matter, no matter what they're uh, what their level of understanding is or what their level of, of, of may, maybe disability or maybe their, their aging, no matter who they are, we're going to give them the same test and in order to gauge how well that teacher has taught that year. And we're going we're gonna to do it in a snapshot. I mean, we're all, all of us in the U.S. at least are facing this kind of, here we are up against the end of the year. Um, I know in, in our schools here, in, in our district here, um, the, the last, we might as well throw away the last uh, five to six weeks of school because uh, because all it is is done is spent on preparing for one test that doesn't really capture everything that a student knows. But when used appropriately, summative assessments can help drive decision making. They can help help you make informed decisions about your learning. However, when summatives are used exclusively in the classroom, like the high stakes testing is or like the summative assessment at the end of a unit, or like the summative assessment that's given, um, like the pop quiz to try it, to, to be a gotcha for students, those don't really help us understand how we can be better teachers and how we can be um, better purveyors of, of, of knowledge in our classrooms. 
the, the truly the, the better way to approach assessment in our classroom is, is on the formative side. And so I, this slide, I love this, this, um, this wheel from, uh, from ASED. So ASED has a huge, it has a, has a wonderful selection of books all related to formative assessment. And this is kind of the formative assessment cycle. But it, it all starts with our, what are we trying to get our students to understand? So a lot of us, or those of us who have classroom experience probably know that we have to, you know, when I was teaching, I had to write my goals and objectives on the board. Well, what did we do? We just copied them straight from our, our standard sheet. Okay, today is goal 1.01. .01. Students will understand the inter, interdimensional dynamics of level, whatever. It meant nothing to kids. So starting with, with kid friend, I think it, I think it goes deeper in starting with kid friendly standards and objectives so that what is it that you want the students to understand? It's some kind of question or something that you want students to be able to understand. Then you're providing that targeted instruction. Then you're, you're doing the, the formative assessment throughout this process. And all the formative assessment is, is understanding what kids know, when they know it, and how do you know they know it. I think it really comes down to those three things. And it sounds like it can be utterly complicated. How am I supposed to gauge what students know, when they know it, and how do I know they know it? It's not as difficult as it sounds. It's actually, as you get, as I think you're going to discover, if you're, if you're new to formative assessment or if it's something that you, you haven't really thought about in your teaching, you're probably already doing these things. It's how you use the information to inform your teaching. It's how you use the information to change, you know, change up what you're going to do the next day. That's the heart of formative assessment. That's, to, to me, having that understanding of what students know when they know it and how you know they know it, uh, is, is where, is really where the benefit comes in. So the formative assessment, what it is and what it is, and just a couple of these, um, the, the formative assessment process, um, uses evidence to make instructional adjustments or varying learning. It, it doesn't move on regardless of student evidence. So those summative assessments, they, like I said, when, when I was first teaching, I would get those, I would do those unit tests and I would say, gosh, those kids just didn't study or those kids just, they, they, they didn't grasp it, but we've got to move on. The formative assessment drives how you teach. You, as a teacher, you have a lesson plan or you've laid out, you know, where you're going to, your, your course roadmap or your, maybe your district does that for you. So you know where you need to go with your instruction. What the formative assessment does is help you better, it, it, it's, it's kind of like the, you've got this roadmap, but what the formative assessment does is help you de determine where you need to, to take a break, where you need to get off the highway in order to spend a little bit more time on a subject, or where you can hit the gas and you can go, you know, faster up the road because your kids got it. it it's really understanding how your kids are, are doing with their content and do they understand in the moment what you know, what, what, what you just taught them. It's not something that waits a day. It's not something that waits till the end of the unit. It's not something that waits till the end of the, uh, to, to the end of the chapter. It happens in the moment. And it's actionable feedback for students. It's something that the students can, that, that you're, that you're, you're giving to them or that you're going to do for them. And that, that term feedback may be tricky. It's not, you may not have anything verbal or anything written that you're going to give to students, but the feedback you're going to do is, so, when I would have students turn in the stickies at the end of class, I would take that information and my feedback would be at the next day, okay, you know, you got, we, we did your stickies and it was really clear that, that a lot of people had trouble with, with the concept of, 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 you know, you know, rock layers in, in terms of evolution. So let's go back and let's revisit that. So that might be my feedback. My feedback to them isn't going to necessarily be, oh, Johnny, you got a you got a 67 on your test. You need to be better next time. It's going to be how I react to the information. And the most important thing to take away from this is that formative assessments are not graded. So a quiz can be a formative assessment, but you're not going to take that for a grade. Summatives are graded. Grades are the final product of learning, and formatives help drive decisions. Formatives help understanding, and, and what I think you'll see is if you do, for, if formative assessment becomes a part of your process, if it becomes part of your natural flow of your teaching, you won't really need to, to do those, those grades, and the formative assessments are, are a, a cornerstone of the, the, um, the gradeless classrooms and the, the standards-based classrooms. They really help drive those, those types of learning. 
uh, you know, once you get into it, you may only give grades for, you know, for large-scale projects or, or things like that. The formative assessments can really help you better understand what students know and when they know it so that you may not have to give a formative. Well, if all your students have an understanding of the concepts that you're teaching and you do a good job of understanding and doing targeted formative assessments, and we'll talk about that in a second, but if you know targetedly that these kids are understanding, again, back to those standards, understanding that you keep, you're always keeping those standards in mind, then the summatives may just disappear from your teaching altogether, as was true with me. I didn't, I didn't give tests anymore. I didn't give graded quizzes anymore because the formative assessments helped drive my understanding of what my kids knew. So let's talk about non-digital ways to do formative assessment. And these are the traditional kind of ways that you've probably already done. But one of the easiest ways is just questioning. Uh, there, there's this, this great piece from Edutopia that talks a lot about the right ways to ask questions. So it's not getting up and putting math problems on the board and saying, Johnny, what's the answer to number one? That's not really a formative assessment. But if the formative assessment piece comes in and says, okay, I'm going to put this problem on the board. We've talked about the process. Or we, or we, maybe we haven't talked about the process. So I'm going to put up this, this type of problem on the board. I want you to, to break into pairs and I want you to think about, based on what we talked about yesterday, how would you solve this? How would you understand this? So, so if I haven't taught them a concept, so let's say I'm talking about dividing fractions. Yesterday we talked about multiplying fractions. Today we talked about dividing fractions. I haven't taught them anything about dividing fractions yet. So I'm going to break them into pairs and I'm going to say, how do you know, how, how would you, try to figure out what this, uh, how you would, how you would, would solve this dividing fractions problem based on what we talked about yesterday. And they're going to, they're going to brainstorm. And then I'm going to know, one, I'm going to know, do they already know how to do this? But two, do they, are they, do they understand what we talked about yesterday? So I can, I can get an informed decision about what they talked about yesterday, but I can also understand, wow, they, these, these kids have got it. They know that multiplying is part of that process. All I got to do is teach them to flip it, and we can move on. So I don't have to spend a lot of time going through mundane processes. I don't have to spend a lot of time going through um, a lot of those boring types of things that happen in the classroom. Just by asking the right questions the right way, I can gain a whole lot of informed information from my students to better inform my to better inform how I'm teaching. And throughout the process, there's, so throughout my lessons, I'm going to be asking those key questions. So if I ask the question, you know, if I ask students the question, what's, you know, what's the answer to, to number, number 12? How do you know it's the answer? And uh, maybe I do that as a group. Maybe I do that in small groups. Maybe I do that as I'm circulating throughout the classroom. It's not just asking for the answer anymore. So formative assessment isn't just looking for the answer, but what it's looking for is, is finding out how do you know what they know. If the kids can come back to you and describe to you their process of understanding, they've got it. They understand what your concept is. Now, as long as that, that falls within kind of what you're teaching, as long as they're not on the wrong track or, you, you know, you may have to do some redirection, but asking kids why they know what they know or how they know what they know is huge in, as part of this process. Another great formative assessment tool that you're probably already using is discussion. A, a great non-digital way to, to do formative assessment. So I, I, before I left my, my, my last position of being um, director of instructional technology for a, for a pretty large district here in North Carolina, we were working on um, a, 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 a bring your own device initiative. And as part of that, we, we really looked at the authentic learning in the classroom. And, and as, Part of authentic learning in the classroom is this whole idea of problem and project-based learning. And so I like the idea of, of teachers just asking questions. And so when students are working on their projects or they're working on solving their problems, how am I going to know, based on my standards of what I, you know, these are my standards that I have to cover today, how am I going to know that my kids are on the right track? It's that discussion, and, and it ties seamlessly back with, uh, back with, with questioning. So what kind of questions when I'm doing these discussions or when I'm going into these groups and I'm talking uh, with these with these groups, what kinds of questions am I going to ask and how am I going to how am I going to know when I walk away? Yeah, they got it. They understand from their standards um, that they know. So, you know, if, if my standard is, you know, understanding water quality and I'm having students do water quality testing, how do they know that their results are accurate? How do they know that their results are reliable or, or how can they know that that um, that information can be used by someone else reliably? So it's just it's getting in this habit of helping them understand rather than 
uh, presenting them summatively at the end and not knowing what they know until the end. It's just having that conversation. And these conversations are just um, are, can be either one-on-one -on -one or can be uh, can be in these small groups. But I like the one-on-ones too. And so, the, but the one-on-ones take time. The one-on-ones talking individually with with students one-on-one -on -one takes time. But you do get a truer understanding of, of where students are. And then another way that you may may have heard about or maybe may um, maybe using yourself is this ticket out the door idea. And I when I when I and again I didn't. I didn't come up with the idea of ticket out the door. It was just something I probably had seen or picked up or, or had heard of. But I just I laid sticky notes out on on the student's desk, um, and I said, anytime you had a question that you didn't feel comfortable that you wanted to ask, you know, you could write your name on the sticky note, and you could come leave it on the corner of my desk. I didn't have anything fancy like a chart with numbers or things like that. Um, I just had a place on my desk where they could put their sticky notes. But the ticket out the door ideas, uh, it really, you know, like. The two pluses and a delta. So, what are uh, what are two things that you learned today, and what's one thing you still have a question about? You know, those are easy, quick, and simple ways to help to have students at the end of class. And that's that's not grade specific. That could be students in a high school class. You know, a senior a senior level AP class. How do you you know what did you learn today, and what did you um, what did you gain from um, from your understanding? So, the, the ticket out the door. Um, is, is something simple like taking a sticky note and, and leaving it on the desk. But um, you can see here from uh, this, this image is great um, that um, you, you can get uh, you know quick checks. You know, hey everybody, uh, write in your sticky note the the answer to number three. So you could uh, it could be just that simple formative. Okay, yep, everybody got it. Let's move on. I really like to take it out the door for the end of the end of the day for the um, for the the understanding of. Here's what I know, and here's what I still have questions about. And it can be anonymous. It can be completely anonymous. And I'm I'm okay with the anonymity. I'm okay with students feeling like they don't want to tell me who they are. Now, if it's consistent, where I'm seeing consistently there's one student who's um, who has a misunderstanding, then I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit a little bit more digging as, as to who it is. But the ticket out the door is a super simple way to to get kids who may not be the ones in the class who want to respond to the questions when the hands are raised or who don't want to tell you that they're having an issue, it can be a really easy way to help you drive those informed decisions later on, um, uh, later on the next day. So those are non-digital ways. And those are those are just those are those work just as well in a connected classroom or a non-connected classroom. I would do, if I had a classroom set full of iPads, I would still pull out the sticky notes every day, every once in a while, or, or even every day, because sometimes the analog ways of doing things are just as good or better as the digital ways. But if you're interested in the digital ways, there are some really cool things and, and cool tools that you can use to to enhance formative assessment in your classroom. So. One of those ways is virtual quizzing, and so what? What the quiz? Now remember, I, I talked about you know how formative assessments aren't graded. What the virtual quizzing allows you to do is quickly and 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 quickly ask the kinds of questions that um, will help you get the the understanding from your students. So there are a couple different ways that you can uh, that you can do virtual quizzing. So one is Socrative or Socrative or however you you know want to say it. A lot of people may have heard of Socrative, but if you haven't heard of Socrative, totally free tool. You sign up as a teacher, and um, and then you get a room number, and then your students join with your room number, and you can ask all kinds of of simple questions. So you've got multiple choice, true, false, short answer, quick quiz. You even have an exit ticket. So kind of like the kind of like a virtual sticky note. You can ask students to respond. Um, and it's a quick and easy. You can do it from your phone. You can do it from your tablet. Students can respond through their um, through their device um, quickly and easily uh, it, just by asking a question, and you can get a, a, a virtual response. Um, the thing the thing with Socrative is that students can put in their name, and so it provides anonymity for them in a, in the sense that no, their name isn't going to be shown unless you want it to be with an answer. So if you wanted to display an answer, so. If you wanted to talk about, you know, if you want to ask a, a specific question that had like a multiple choice answer, and so okay, let's let's look at problem number number four and work in your small groups to answer number four, and it had an ABC response, and you threw those answers up on the board. You would see a compilation of those results. So three people answered A, four people answered B, so on and so forth. But you wouldn't get names, but you would be able to see the names in your data 
afterwards. You would be able to see who answered what, and if, if a student was consistently just not understanding, that could help you drive, okay, I need to give some individual assistance to this particular student, or I need to have a one-on-one -on -one with this student to, to better understand um, what they're learning. So Socratic is one. Poll Everywhere is another. I'm a big fan of Poll Everywhere. I, I use Poll Everywhere a lot when I go um, present live. It's, it's a wonderful tool. Same kind of deal. Set up the question. Um, the difference here, there's not quite as many options as there is in Socratic, but I can respond a multiple different ways. So all I have to know is the poll number and the poll name, and, and all of those are based on numbers, and um, they've got really great instructions. But I can respond through text message. I can respond through a website. I can respond through Twitter, lots of different ways. And I can keep those open. So if I have a problem, let's say, so I go home, and I have a problem or I, I you know, I'm not understanding something, so, you know, we can go home and we can read. Maybe we're reading Macbeth, and I come across a scene that I really am having trouble with. Then I can leave my, as a teacher, I can leave the poll everywhere open in the evening and have students respond, just text in, you know, what, what they're thinking as they read that scene, or, you know, or they can text in their question. And then I've, ga I've gathered those automatically so that when I, you know, get ready to prepare for my lesson for the next day, you know, I'm looking over things in the morning, I've got those right there, and I can display them on my classroom, and we can talk about them as a group. So another, and not necessarily a new one, but another one that that um, that is, is is really kind of cool is infused learning. So infused learning, similar to Socrative, the difference is infused learning has a draw response. So it, it allows you to so same kind of setup. You you set up set up your classroom as a as a teacher. They have a code. They join your class. They put in their name. You can have students draw a response. So you can have students draw, draw their reaction to something. You can have their students. Um, write a word problem or, or write a um, write a uh, the uh, the answer to something you know and just hold it up or send it in. Um, so similar to Socratic, but uh, you have that ability to do a draw response um, really kind of bumps it up a notch. So those are three kind of virtual quizzing options. Each one of them have advantages and disadvantages. So I would encourage you to look at each one and see what each one would mean for you. Um, all of them are free. Uh, you know, for the classroom use, so a Poll Everywhere does have paid features if you needed more than, than a certain number of responses, but generally in the classroom, the, the number of free responses you get would be enough. So take a look at each one and, and see which one would, would, bet, would best fit your learning. So we talked about, you know, sticky notes you can use in the classroom. I love the virtual sticky notes, and there are two great services you can use. Um, you've got uh, Linoit. So Linoit. Um, allows you to, I'm sorry, this is Padlet. So Padlet um, used to be, and see, Pad, Padlet used to be, um, I forget what it used to be. Somebody probably remembers the name that Padlet used to be, Wallwisher. Uh, that uh, it changed, they changed their name to Padlet for whatever reason. But it's virtual, uh, virtual sticky notes that you can write up. So I could write up some kind of question. I could do the plus delta. So what are two things you learned? What is one thing you saw the question about? Kids could come up and post these. The beauty of it is, one, it's paperless. They can do it from a uh, from anywhere, from pretty much from any device, and um, I, they can do it any time. So again, so if they go home and they have a question that they wanted to be able to uh, that you wanted to gather some feedback on after they did something, you know, um, as part of homework or you know continued learning or something like that, you could use the Padlet in order to gain that that information. Another one of my favorites is Linoit. So Linoit um, does a little bit, uh, has a little bit more features, but allows you to embed video and audio and videos. So it could be a, you know, that true demonstration of how do you know what you know. So students, if you're asking them kind of to summarize their learning, and the way they did that was through a video, then they could post that video through the Linoit. I think you can do that in Padlet, but um, I know Linoit, you can definitely embed video and audio, and you can link out to different social networks um, and bring that information over and share that information. So those virtual sticky notes are, are just just like the sticky notes I used to use in my classroom, the, uh, just like the ones we would, you could put on the on the back of the door. It's called Linoit, so it's L-I-N-O, I'll type it here in the chat, L-I-N-O, I think that the email address is en.lino.it. Um, and that will um, that'll get you to that one. I, I like them both. I think both of them are, are great. Yeah, they're 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 both great tools. So there. Are, so those are some some of those those kind of tie back to those traditional. So 
the virtual quizzing kind of ties back to the quiz that you might would give, uh, the three or four question quiz. Um, you know, I was a big user. I, I had active expressions um, in my classroom, and so we used the active expression devices, the clicker devices, and I could ask a couple of questions, and those those were super easy ways, and those are kind of, you, you can use the, the virtual options now. Or, um, so those are kind of similar, and then you've got the virtual sticky notes. But let's think about some other ways that you could do formative assessment, some ways that you might not have thought about with some, some tools that you might not know that might be out there. So one of those ways that I really like is Google is, is Google Drive. And Google Drive has a commenting feature in it. And, and a lot of you know that you probably um, can leave comments in there. But the comments that you can leave in Google Drive can be a really huge asset to understanding what students know. And, and you can really, if, especially if you do kind of a, a virtual option in your class or you do uh, if you do a blended learning in your class, the, the comments can provide a really great way to understand and so, so I can highlight and say, well, what were you trying to get at here? And it, again, we can do it really paperless. We do it virtually. Um, and, and it, it really, I don't, I, eventually I'm going to meet, we're going to talk one on one, but if, if I'm really, I'm trying to grade a lot of papers. So a buddy of mine, Nick Provenzano, um, the nerdy teacher, he, um, I, he uses the commenting features in Google Docs. So they turn in their, their works. And uh, a lot of teachers I know use the commenting features because it allows for that instant interaction. So the kids can be at home. They're going to get the message that, some, that their teacher left a comment. They can go in and leave their comment. And, and then the next day in class, we can talk about it. So it's, it's a, a super dead simple way um, to understand the student understanding, especially in the writing and the English classroom. Um, another way is AudioBoo. So I love AudioBoo. And so that, that can allow me to gain a lot of understanding for my kids. So I'm going to, I'm going to read a paper or I'm going to do some, some kind of, of um, some kind of, of looking at, okay, what did this student mean when they were doing this? So similar to the commenting feature, but I'm going to record the audio and I'm going to attach it to, to the work. So audio is a totally free program. I can put it on my phone and you can, down, you can download it from the web and you can record your, your feedback or your snippets and gain an understanding. On the reverse, students can do the same. So students, you can, you can have students submit um, each day through audio boo the three, the two things that they learned and the one thing that they would, um, that they still have a question about. And so instead of them writing, um, which can be, which can be trouble, which, you know, it can be hard for students to translate what they understand through their writing, um, maybe they would be better just dictating that information through audio boost so they can speak what they, what they know, uh, or how they know what they know. So it can just be another way. Again, totally free, so easy, comes right to you, um, super easy to use. VoiceThread, so I, I love VoiceThread. I think VoiceThread is a really cool tool, so I can load up um, all my information or, all, you know, I can load up my lesson and I can ask a question. And then VoiceThread, you, know, you can see uh, the box, the, the profile images around the sides. Those are all comments that people have left. So I can leave a, a text comment. I can leave a video comment. I can leave a, um, I can leave a, a telephone comment. I can do all kinds of things where I can comment on the, 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 what, what's the, the, you know, so here, um, is a, is an image of, uh, the, the roadrunner. So, you know, what, we could be talking about the physics behind it. So, um, you know, leaving their feedback on, well, what, what kind of variables would affect how the anvil would fall on the, on the roadrunner? And we talked about variables in, in air, you know, air, um, uh, air resistance and things like that. We could have that conversation. So again, just voice thread could be another tool that, um, that you could use if write, you know, writing may hamper their ability to tell you what they know. They may could use video. Um, they may could use audio. It's just another way. And then um, you've probably heard a lot about Classflow. So, so Classflow was another cool way. To, uh, what I like about Classflow is it's the total solution. Um, so not only do you, can you design your lesson in Classflow, but you can also deliver your lesson to Classflow 100% completely free. In fact, I think a part of the conference you'll get um, you'll get invited to join Classflow or you'll, you'll get an account, which is really awesome. You can design your lesson in Classflow. Works on any device. It's no app needed. It works straight in the browser. But then you've got, you've got eight different types of, um, eight different types of, of ways that you can, um, can assess students. You've got the traditional yes, no, true, false, multiple choice. Scales, you can have students text in their answers. 
Um, word feed is one of my favorites because you can ask students, um, you know, questions and, you know, what, you know, what was the author thinking when they wrote this? And so you'll get lots of, you know, give me, give me two words on what you think the author was thinking when they wrote this passage. And, uh, they, you, you do the word feed, but if the, if the words are the same, they group together automatically on the screen and it, it, it kind of creates this big, um, this big graphic that you can really look and see what, um, what students are thinking. But the creative piece, I think, is the bigger one. So um, what Classflow allows you to do is, is whatever the, the teacher sees on their screen, I can send to the student's devices with one click. And then I can start a creative poll. So, so let's say I, I post an image on the screen and I tell my students, I want you to circle all of the polygons that you see on this image. Well, the same image that they saw on the teacher screen, they now see on their device. I've started a creative question. They can use their finger and they can just circle um, using their pen tool, the answer, uh, all the answers on the screen. Um, or I can have them say, okay, I want you to go through, I want you to take one picture of an octagon in the classroom. So they get their device, they take their picture, they submit it in, then I can pull all those in um, into, my, into my lesson. Um, there's lots of information on Classflow. Um, uh, Classflow.com, you can learn about it. Um, and that's, a, that's another, a, just another way kind of the total package kind of where you can design your lesson and form the assess all at the same time. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I wanted to talk about today. So I hope that, you know, you'll, you'll take the, these ideas of, of formative assessment and um, take these ideas of, of, of really what it comes down to is understanding what students know, when they know it, and really beyond that, how do they know what they know? How do, they, how do you know what students know? And it's all in an effort to better drive your teaching. Uh, seriously, when I discovered uh, that it was so much easier for me to be in the moment and say, okay, Stephen, how, how do you know that the kids just got what you were talking about with the layers of the earth? Instead of waiting until the end of the unit, which might be in four days, how do you know that they know that, you know, the, there, are, there are four layers to the earth? Or how do you know that, you know, the, the layers of the atmosphere? How do you know they know the elements of the periodic table. All right, so what you need to do is you need to ask them in the moment. I mean, it sounds so simple, but when you're teaching, you get caught up in, into, the, into how you've been taught to teach or you get caught up in the moment. But taking that time to, to use these tools or to use the digital tools or to use the analog tools to understand what students know, first and foremost, but how do they know what they know? Not only are you better driving the decisions that you're going to make in your classroom in, in terms of your teaching, but you're going to produce better learners because they're going to have to understand to be able to explain what they know. They're going to have to understand how do, they, how do I know what I know? How am I going to be able to explain to my teacher what I know? Because I know that my teacher is going to be asking me. So I think that, um, I, I think that there's, there's a, a huge benefit here to, to understanding what we know and, and how we can be better teachers, but also understanding how do we know what kids know and how can we get kids to be deeper thinkers about their learning. Remember, everything that I did today, everything that I did today is linked um, over on that bit.ly link, and you can get all the resources, all the images, all the links, all the, the, um, all the, uh, the tools that we talked about. Um, it's open for comment, so if you, if you have an idea or you want to say, hey, I've used this tool, I think it, you know, this is how I did it, you can leave a comment, you can highlight it, leave a comment there, um, so that we'll all see it there. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I will post back to my information there. Um, if anybody wants to pop a question in the chat, I'll stick around for just a second or two or for, you know, a couple minutes and see if anybody has any questions. And I will allow you to take the microphone if you have a question for Steve. You just click on the talk button underneath um, the image of me now or where Stephen's name was, uh, or just uh, put it on the chat and Steve will notice it. If you want to clap, hover over the smiley face in the participant window and go down to the applause button. Much harder to find than it used to be, but still an effective way of communicating appreciation. And we do appreciate you, Steve. Oh, thank you. This was fun. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. 
If you have a question for Steve, you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand, or you can just grab the microphone. We may be done. Well, that was fun. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, here you go. So how do you install, how do you install the features and use these tools in 45-minute class period? Yeah, so th that's a great question. So we're always crunched for time. We're always trying to figure out, okay, I've got a certain amount of content that I have to, to, to crunch in in a certain amount of time. But I think the, the, uh, the idea with Formative is that it gives you your time back. Um, it gives you it gives you a lot of your the information back to you so that you can it, just by just by asking simple questions or just even if you did it at the end of the you know the end of the day if you used you know um, in view, you know Socrative let's say and you used the ex exit ticket feature or even if you didn't have every kid didn't have another device and you wanted to use one of the the sticky note methods doing that at the end of class will help you. And, you know, because we're pushed for time, you know, we're trying to push through our content and making sure, okay, I'm, I've got this amount of information I have to cover today, and that means I have this amount of information I have to cover today. And really, sometimes that does a disservice to kids because kids, they, they might not be able to move at that pace. So the, the formative assessment, I think, will give you some of that time and, in, and especially inspiration back because you'll feel better about understanding, okay, I know what my kids know now. Or I know that my kids don't know and I need to spend a little bit more time. So it's going to help you be a more informed decision maker in your classroom of saying, okay, I need to start tomorrow's lesson with recapping what we did today. Or, you know what, I don't need to do that. They've got it. I can move on. I can spend a lot more time talking about something else. So it, it's a great question. But I think the, the formative assessments can give you some of that time back. Steve, did you see the question there uh, asking if you have any video of the classroom in motion? Um, you know what? I let me. I'm going to do a little bit of digging. I think I've got some stuff. If I when I find it, I'll put it on that doc. Do you find that kids feel more value when this type of assessment is done regularly? I, I definitely because they they feel like they're they're being heard. They don't feel like so. If the teacher, all the teacher does is all we do is take a test and then we move on. And and I don't really know. You know, I don't really understand. Rather, when when the kids feel like okay. Um, I've got to. I've got to be able to explain. I've got to be able to know. They feel like they're more a part of their classroom. They're more a part of that learning. They they have that better understanding that, that the teacher really cares about what I'm doing. That they. Uh, you're right. They do feel. Um, they do feel more valued in the classroom. I believe. Well, this is great. I know there are sessions that are starting at one. Do. Um, you know, hang out, and, and I hope that you can catch the other sessions. There's some really great, um, there's some other great um, speakers who are talking today, and uh, and uh, uh, some great sessions this afternoon and this evening, no matter where you are, this morning, wherever you are. So thank you, everybody, for coming to hang out with me. I do appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. I'm clapping for you again. There are some really great sessions coming up this next hour. You can go to reinventingtheclassroom.com, click on your time zone on the schedule page, and um, we've got sessions from three countries next hour. Take care, Steve. Take care, everybody. Bye now.